Sometimes they can become resistant to different ways of doing things. So can we. Generals and admirals carefully consider the field of battle. They plan for varying terrains. They account for land, sea, and air as they look for victory. But new settings of warfare have caused many problems. Jungles are odd terrain. Urban warfare introduces civilians into the battle. Warfare has changed greatly due to these new monkey wrenches being thrown into the mix. Present-day generals cannot simply train their soldiers to match wits with enemies on the battlefield by having key knowledge of what the enemy will do because the, that knowledge changes over time. The tactics that worked in World War II do not, did not work in the Vietnam War. I think we should pay attention. The Bible says we should be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I think we should pay attention to the tactics that we use. You and I, I preached about this several weeks ago, you and I find ourselves in the middle of, of a war, of a spiritual war. We, we are in the middle of a battle every day, and I think we should pay attention to the tactics that we're employing, amen? Since the Viet Cong did not have a centralized command, various ground leaders plotted their own ways of doing things. Similarly, insurgents in places like Iraq and Afghanistan do not look to a chief commander to plot all their objectives. Therefore, soldiers and military leaders find it very difficult to deal with these groups. The predictability of warfare disappeared a long time ago and will probably not reemerge. Even superior weapons, vehicles, and technology cannot ensure wins. But one thing has not changed. Soldiers must be able to trust each other and their leaders. If they cannot, they will certainly lose the battle. And I believe that applies to us today. I believe you and I, first of all, need to be able to trust each other. Everybody had biscuits and gravy for breakfast. We need to be able to trust each other. We ought to be the kind of people with Christ at the center of our lives, led by the Spirit, that our brothers and our sisters can trust us. I hope that it is never said of me that my brother or my sister can't trust me. I don't want to do anything to lose your trust. I want you to know that in the spiritual realm, I've got your back. And I think we should all feel that way. We, we need each other. This church needs every one of us. We're in a battle together. And the enemies that we face are unpredictable. Of course, God knows all things, and God knows what they're about and what the attack of the enemy is, but you and I don't know the, every one of the enemy's battle plans. If we did, we'd never fall into his trap. We need to trust each other, and we need to trust God. Amen? Let's talk about the faith of Naaman's maid. Uh, so our story today focuses on... Um, uh, uh, Naaman is kind of the character of the story, but we're focusing today on his ma maid. But Naaman was an outsider to the faith of Israel. He was an outsider to the, the knowledge that Israel had of their God. And not only that, Naaman was a leper. And um, under the scripture, under the Old Testament, that made Naaman unclean. And so Naaman might have uh, always remained an outsider to the things of God because of his uncleanness, because he was a leper. He, because of who he was, he could never approach the holiness of God. He could never approach the things of God because of his uncleanness. And so not only because of his Syrian heritage, but also because of his leprosy, Laman was a man who uh, it seemed would always be on the outside an outsider to the things of God. You would be hard-pressed to find an individual <laughs> uh, more outside the good graces of God than Naaman. But I'm thankful that even for people that find themselves in that situation, God has a plan. And God had a plan, a beautiful plan, for, for Naaman's life. But I want you to know that just like Naaman, who was a leper, he was not of the right heritage. He was not born into this. He, uh, he did not come from the right people. He was born about as far away from God as you could be. And then on top of that, he became a leper, which leprosy we know in the Bible is symbolic. It's a type for sin. And so it was treated as that. It was treated as a physical uh, symbol of sin. And so he was unclean and no one would come near him. In fact, in those days, uh, the people who had leprosy, when they would walk through the streets, they would have to shout, unclean. 
so that no one would come near them because they didn't want the leprosy to spread. The clean people didn't want anything to do with the unclean people. But I want you to know today that it does not matter where you start out. It doesn't matter how swampy your mire is. It doesn't matter how dark your darkness is. Jesus did not come for those who are whole. <laughs> he said, those that are whole do not need a physician, but those that are sick. He came for the ones that, that need a physician. They need a healing. They need a salvation. They need a cleansing. It doesn't matter how bad you think you are. It does not matter how outside of God's good graces you think you are. Jesus loves you. And Jesus died for you. And Jesus wants to give you the gift of salvation. And so, in Naaman's story, the Lord strategically placed this young Israelite girl uh, into Naaman's household. She was a maid and she was a servant. ...of a slave girl. And uh, that's what she was going to do, but the Lord had other plans in planting her in Naaman's life. And you know, the Lord knows how to send us just what we need, right when we need it, and in a package that we least expected. I don't think anybody in Naaman's household would have expected that little Israelite maid, that little slave, to be the answer to Naaman's healing to be the key, the, the connection that changed Naaman's life forever in, in, the, in the most um, effective and the most consequential way that it could change to go from being a leper to not being a leper. All that story, of course, he met with Elisha and, and the king of Israel became distraught and all of these things, but the connection started with that little girl from Israel that nobody suspected would ever amount to anything. The Lord today. The Lord knows how to send us what we need right when we need it. He knows how to place the right person in our lives. Maybe you have a story in your mind that you can think of where you can look back and you can say, God put that person in my life. God knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> he knew who to send and with the right word at the right time. I was thinking as I was preparing for this morning, I was thinking about a story that uh, Sister Vernon shared in our home Bible study training. Um, she spoke at our home Bible study training. We had an awesome time, awesome move of God um, that turned from a, a training to a, a prayer meeting. <laughs> uh, we had a wonderful move of the Lord, but she shared a story about <clears throat> a, a time in her life where um, she was seeking the Lord about how effective she was in, in reaching people and the Lord gave her a dream, and I, I can't tell it like she told it, but uh, she, she had a dream, and it seemed like this dream went on forever and ever and ever, and, and it was all these different people that were impacting this one person's life, um, this, this one little boy's life, and then as he grew up into adulthood and became a minister, and, and this was a story that the Lord was un, unveiling to her in her dream, and the Lord spoke to her at the end of that and told her that, it takes hundreds of people to win a soul. It takes all of these different people. It's not just the one person that gives the one Bible study, but all of these people across this person's life had an impact and gave him the one encouraging word that he needed at that one time or picked him up when he, when he needed a little help getting up off the ground. Whatever it was, all of those people contributed to this guy's story of going from nothing to to being used in the way God wanted him to be used. And I think that's so important for us to remember that, first of all, <laughs> if we're not careful, we'll get the mindset like the king of Israel got, where we're faced with this situation or with a friend that uh, we really want to be saved and uh, maybe we've known them a long time and it just seems almost, maybe almost like an impossible situation as some of us used to be. Um, if we're not careful, we get the king's mindset like the salvation is on us, like we're the savior, like we've got to save this person. We've got to break this person's addiction. We've got to pull this person out of this sin. We've got to get this person to understand, but that's not the case. We're, we are not, we're not the savior, and we've got to be careful to remember that. We can point them to the one who has the power to heal all of that, but, but we are not the one that does it. 
But that being said, that's no reason for us to not be involved. I think the Lord has been speaking very clearly to us in the last several weeks, last month or so, about us getting involved, about us contributing. Um, just sermon after sermon after sermon, if you've, if you've been listening to the word that's been going out, talking about the power in your hand, talking about getting involved in the kingdom, that there's something you can do, pastor uh, encouraging us to find that, really almost pleading with us, to find that one thing we can get involved in. You never know when that one thing could be your moment where you're like the maid in Naaman's house, and you're the key that links that person to their life being changed forever, forever, in a way that you never would have expected. I, I doubt that the maid, when she got carried off from Israel, <laughs> when she was taken captive as a slave, I doubt that she really saw a lot of God in that situation in that moment. I doubt that she really thought, well, bless God, this is God calling me into my new ministry. <laughs> this, new, this, this struggle that I'm gonna face, this unimaginable situation that I'm gonna face, I'm being taken captive into a foreign land. I don't know what's gonna happen to me. I don't know what my future holds. I doubt she threw up her hands and shouted, glory. <laughs> I'm sure she probably felt sorry for herself. And if we weren't all asleep, I think we would all agree she probably felt sorry for herself, right? But then when she got there, God changed the story completely. And it really was God calling her into her next step of ministry to save the man that took her as a slave. Well, that's a completely different uh, sermon right there. <laughs> The maid of Naaman uh, was a slave as a victim of war, but she was part of God's plan. The rest of the world would have counted her out because of her status. The rest of the world would have counted her as insignificant. She could never do anything for God. She's just a slave, but our God is the only God who can take nothing and turn it into something magnificent. The young maid had survived a great test, and when the opportunity presented itself, she shared her testimony. You and I cannot be afraid to share our testimony. But there is a world out there that needs to hear your testimony. Not, not our testimony, it needs to hear your testimony. Everybody's testimony. Everybody in this room has a testimony of how God has brought you to where you are. And the world needs, there's somebody out there that needs to hear your testimony. We can't be afraid to share it. While the maid could have felt deep resentment toward Naaman and his wife, uh, they were the slave masters and they were Syrians, uh, she showed love and care for her captors. She told her mistress, which was Naaman's wife, that she wished that her master could meet with the prophet in Samaria. And at that point, if he could do that, that surely Naaman would be cured of his illness. I probably would think some things that I wished would happen to my captor. It probably wouldn't be his healing. <laughs> well, I'm just going to be honest with you today. That's just, that's our flesh. That's our nature, you know. That's not instinctive. But somewhere this, this uh, maid from Israel found a place of love and, and, she, and compassion. And she, she said, surely if, if he could meet the prophet, he could be healed. And it's interesting that although slaves at that time were often forbidden to speak, they didn't even have a voice. And you may feel like you don't have a voice today, but they didn't even have a voice. She still found the courage to speak up at the right moment. She said the right thing at the right time. In fact, her faith overcame her fear of what might happen to her if she spoke up. And so she shares her knowledge of the prophet and the miraculous power um, that God worked through this prophet, the authority of God, and this sets a, in motion a series of events for Naaman, um, who was an outsider to the kingdom, but God had a plan to make him an insider. I'm thankful that while I used to be an outsider, God made me an insider. I'm thankful for the story of redemption today. Amen. God had a plan to make Naaman an insider. So let's talk about Syria's war with Israel. Naaman was probably a guy who was used to feeling in control uh, given his uh, 
status and uh, his position, um, I've learned that uh, much like Naaman, uh, as humans um, in our flesh, most people like to feel in control. Um, can I get an amen? Um, no wonder submission to God is such a hard thing. Because if we submit to God, we're no longer in control. We're no longer in control of our life. We're no longer in control of our future. We're no longer in control of the things that we think we worked so hard to accomplish. It's giving up control. That's a hard thing to do. That is an uncomfortable thing to do. But Naaman was probably used to being in control. And, you know, I've learned that life will throw you obstacles and situations where you find yourself anything but in control. Suddenly something happens in your life and you realize that you are not in control of this thing. If you've never had that situation, uh, count yourself blessed up to this point, but it will happen. Something will happen in your life where you realize that I am not in control of this thing. A doctor's report that you can do nothing about, a financial crisis you can do nothing about, a family member that turns their back on God and you start to question what you could have done differently, I'm telling you today that life has a way of sending you a reality check, that you're not really in control of all the things that you thought you were in control of. And so a man that was likely used to being in control, given his position and his authority, he found himself no longer in control. He was no longer in control of his health. He was no longer in control of his status. He was no longer in control of his future. In, in the blink of an eye, in, in just a, a, a split second, a moment, your life can change forever. And you can go from feeling like you had it all figured out and, and you were in control of this thing to, God, I don't know what I'm going to do. And this is what happened to Laman. He was a leper, and, and he found himself no longer in control. His high rank in the army and the fact that when he gave orders, people listened, and his status and his wealth, the Scripture describes him as a man of valor, his valor, none of that at this point mattered because none of that had any effect on his leprosy. Nothing that he had in and of himself Nothing in his own ability could cure him of his uncleanness. I want you to know there's nothing you and I could ever do to buy our salvation. It's only by the grace of God that we sit here today. It's only by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we sit here today. Naaman realized he was not in control. Some people get upset at God uh, because something goes wrong in their life. And they say, but but God, I'm a believer. God, I've served you my whole life, and look at what it brought me. Maybe you've been there. I've been there. I've been at that place where I said, God, I've, I've served you faithfully. Why would you ever let this happen to your child? God, haven't I been faithful to you these last few years, and yet you let this happen to me? God, I thought you were supposed to take care of me. I want you to listen to this. Serving the Lord and the Lord taking care of you does not mean that you will not face hard times. It does not mean that the enemy will not come against you. It doesn't mean that people won't hurt you. It doesn't mean that people won't talk about you and lie about you and gossip about you. Man, if there's anything I hate, it's a gossiping spirit. But you know what? It's gonna happen. People are gonna gossip about you. People are gonna think they've got it figured out and they're gonna share what they think they've got figured out and that person's gonna share what they think they've got figured out and before you know it, <laughs> well, a big, a big uh, web has been weaved. But just because you serve the Lord doesn't mean those things won't happen to you. What it does mean is that even though my life is falling apart, even though my ship is rocking on a turbulent sea, even though it seems like the waves are about to come over the boat, even though it seems like my boat is about to sink, my life is over, there is no hope for me, I can cry out to my God. 
Master, don't you care that I perish? And all of a sudden, Jesus brings a peace that passes all understanding. He rebukes the wind and the storm of my mind, and he says, peace, be still. And all of a sudden, when I thought God didn't care because God was in the bottom of the boat on a pillow, <laughs> I think that's interesting. The scripture says he, he had a pillow. He was really asleep. But they said, Master, don't you care that we perish? And, and he just gets up and just rebukes the wind, says, peace, be still, and just like that, it's all over. Just because we have the peace speaker in our boat doesn't mean we won't face a storm. But what it does mean is I've got a God that I can go to in the middle of my struggle when I think I'm gonna lose my mind, when I think this situation's not gonna work out, when I don't see the good in this. God, I don't see you in this. I don't see you in this struggle. I don't see you in this storm. I don't see you working. Don't you care that I perish? And all of a sudden, God shows up on the scene. Being a Christian doesn't mean that you won't have storms or moments that you're not in control, but it does mean that you have a God that is greater than the storm. You have a God that is in control even when you're not. Naaman's actions also come into question when we think about Syria's war with Israel the Syrians were also known as the Aramaeans, and uh, that's a name that's associated with the Aramaic language. If you uh, study any of that and study about uh, Christ and how that was thought to be his native language, but throughout the, the pages of the Bible, the Syrians and the Israelites fiercely rivaled each other, and this was often uh, culminated in war. They fought over territory, and they killed, and they slaughtered, and they enslaved each other. And the situation would grow even worse, while 2 Kings 5 tells us the story of Naaman. 2 Kings 8 features a narrative of Elisha proclaiming that Hazel would be the king of Syria. And when Elisha prophesied to Hazel, he could not help but weep for all the slaughter and the devastation that this person would cause in their rule, and so he would, uh, this person, Hazel, would kill Israelite young men, he would dash their children to pieces, he would rip open pregnant women. All of these tragedies reveal this deep-seated hatred between these two nations for each other. And so the Lord, what that tells us is that the Lord showed extreme favor by even opening up the door, by even opening up the possibility for Naaman to be healed. And it was extreme favor toward us that he even opened up the door for our salvation. See, people say, well, how can, how can, there be a, how can God be a loving God? How can you believe in a God that sends people to hell? Well, you're looking at this from the completely wrong perspective. The fact that the door was even open, that he even gave us the choice to avail ourselves of this sacrifice that he made, of the salvation that he's offered us, that in and of itself is, is unbelievable, undes indescribable grace, that the door was even opened. And so for Naaman, it's the same thing. The fact that the door was even opened for the possibility for Naaman to be healed, this is extreme favor from God. But somehow, a young maid who might have lost her family, Maybe she even lost her family to Naaman's sword. She shared the healing power of God with her captor. You and I have to be willing to share the healing power of God with those around us, even when those around us are the ones that have hurt us. We also face the challenge of sharing the gospel with people that have hurt us. We, we may feel that uh, we have good reasons to withhold what we know about God from people who have treated us awfully, but those are human reasons. We have to rise above our humanity and our, uh, our, uh, our flesh, and we have to see things spiritually. That bullying coworker needs to hear about the power of God. We have to show grace and forgiveness to that unforgiving boss I'm not talking about my boss in case he's watching. Um, we must speak up to help a complaining neighbor. Um, although we 
may think that we found the time to be silent or maybe even the right to be silent. If anybody had a right to be silent, it was this maid in Naaman's house. It could be that God is actually calling us to speak. It may be that God is trying to reach those people that are in our lives in an uncomfortable way, (laughs) trying to reach them through us. And it may be that God is trying to teach us something in the process. It would have been easy for that maid in Naaman's house to say, you know what, somebody else can witness to him. Somebody else can tell that guy about salvation. He's hurt me too bad. He took my family. He took me from my country. He enslaved me. He's hurt me too bad. I'm just going to keep my mouth shut, and there will be somebody else that can witness to him along the way, but maybe that's not God's plan. Maybe God's plan is to put you in that situation, that uncomfortable situation, at the right time, for the right reason, to further his kingdom. And maybe he's teaching you something in the process. One of those things that he might be teaching us is humility. That would be a humbling experience, I think, that that maid went through. I've heard it said many times, and I do think it's true, uh, though I don't think it's necessarily the reason every single time, but I do think it's true Uh, In most cases, the saying goes, hurting people hurt other people, or hurt people hurt people. I think that's true. I don't think that's just a justification or an excuse. I think there's truth in that. But it does raise a very important point for us as believers uh, that we need to remember, and that especially in those moments when our emotions are high and our adrenaline is high, and those wounds are fresh. The, the fact is that the facts aren't always as they seem. In fact, things are rarely as they seem. People's lives are rarely as you see them. More often, you see the tip of the iceberg, and there's a full glacier, full iceberg underneath the, underneath the water that you have no idea what that person's going through. You have no idea that person's circumstances. That's why I hate a gossiping spirit. Because the gossiping spirit spreads what you think you know. (laughs) But there's so much more that we don't know about that person's life. And so, especially in those moments when our emotions are high and our adrenaline is high, we need to remember that this may not really be how I think it is. You never know what someone else is going through. You don't know the doctor's report they got that morning. You don't know the bad news they received by phone that day. You don't know how deeply they're hurting. And I'd say many times when people hurt us, it's not even really about us. Uh, We live in a self-centered world. We live in a world where narcissism is rampant and that will damage your attitude toward the kingdom of God. If you think it's all about you, you will not have the right attitude toward the kingdom But can you imagine what could happen if every time somebody picked a fight with us, we just responded with the gospel? Can you imagine what would happen to this community if when the Holy Ghost moves on us in the checkout line to speak to that person in front of us, here's a crazy idea, we did it. We listened to the Holy Ghost and we shared the gospel with that person. I know that's intimidating, and we think, we think, that must not really be the Lord talking to me. <laughs> well, that was just some crazy thought I had. I, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know every scripture there is about salvation. And even if I did, I'm not really good at talking to strangers. I'm an introvert. But you may not know every scripture about salvation. You may not even know where to point them to. I hope you can at least point them to Acts 2.38. But you may not even know that. But you've got a testimony You know your testimony better than anybody does. You can tell somebody what God has done for you. And you have no idea how that word might change that person's life forever. You know that maid in Naaman's house, she didn't give him a whole bunch of scripture. She didn't say, well, I am the Lord that healeth thee, blah, 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 blah. No, she said, I've seen with my own eyes, there's this dude over in Israel that God uses to heal people. And if you can just go meet him, you can be healed. See, witnessing becomes so much easier when we, when we bring it down to that level. 
I know a church in Salem where you can go and your life can be changed forever. And I know it can because he changed my life forever when I got there. I've seen people broken from addiction. I've seen cancer healed. I've seen lives changed. I've seen marriages put back together. And I know where you can go to experience that. That's what witnessing is all about. You can tell somebody what God has done for you. Your testimony in Walmart might talk a drug addict out of an overdose that night. See, there's a reason the Lord moves on us to do these things. Your testimony to that person in Walmart in the checkout line that you've never met before might be God intervening in a person's life, and you might talk a suicidal person that feels like their life is helpless and they're worthless and they have no value off the cliff of ending their life that night. We've got to rise up in this last hour. We need to rise up like Naaman's maid who was completely unexpected. (laughs) She probably didn't even expect to be in that situation. Never dreamed she would have an impact. Never dreamed God would ever use her for anything. Her life was over. But she spoke up at the right time and let God use her. We need to find the courage in the Holy Ghost to go tell somebody about Jesus. We're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. We need to share that with the world, amen? Once Naaman heard about the wonder-working prophet, uh, he wanted to meet him. Uh, You know, once people hear about Jesus and the good things about Jesus, they'll want to meet him. Once people hear about a church where they can be touched and their life can be changed, they're going to want to check it out. Naaman did not care that uh, he was a Syrian and Elisha was an Israelite. That hatred, that racism didn't matter in that moment. Naaman did not care that he only had secondhand information. (laughs) He did not care about the source. In fact, he did not consider the source. Naaman decided that if there was a chance that his life could be changed, what happened was he went from complete hopelessness to maybe there's a chance. And that was enough for him to decide that he was going to go see this prophet that could supposedly heal him. Now, given his elite status in Syria, Naaman could appeal to the Syrian king for help. And so the the king gets involved and he writes this letter to the king of Israel that we mentioned earlier. And so this kind of diplomatic exchange starts taking place. But uh, Naaman immediately... He was he, he, this man of valor in the military with people under his command. He immediately set out on this 135-mile journey from Syria to Israel. Sometimes for us, it's, it's a, a long way to drive 10 minutes to church. You can say amen or oh me, but it's the truth. Naaman travels 135 miles to get his healing, and he spares no expense. He, he, he goes all out to, to accomplish this. He takes 10 talents of silver, 6,000 pieces of gold, and, and 10 changes of clothes, and these gifts reveal his wealth and his power that uh, he thought he had the means to try to buy his healing, and it also shows that he has the ability to protect himself. His, he can protect himself and his goods and his with his entourage, but uh, no one would dare to attack such a mighty warrior that's going traipsing through the the countryside like this. But um, his ideas didn't really go according to plan because the king of Israel reacted very negatively to the letter. This didn't go the way Naaman thought. (laughs) Uh, Oftentimes, things that God has in store don't go the way we think. But thanks to God, Elisha heard about this whole situation and the king that uh, was um, having a conniption about this, and Elisha steps in to help. And you know the story, and we don't have to go through it completely, but uh, Elisha gives uh, Naaman very specific instructions, very specific instructions. You remember what they were? Dip in the Jordan seven times, that's right, and... So he goes, and, uh, he goes to Elisha, and Elisha gives him these instructions, and Naaman is like, no way. <laughs> if all it took was dipping in some water, we've got much better rivers in Syria, right? 
Remember, that's what he said. We've got, we've got much cleaner, much better, much, much more suitable ways of fixing this thing than what you're telling me. This does not make sense. It's illogical, and I'm not going to do it. And it's really interesting that he travels 135 miles because this guy has the key to his healing, right? He gets there, and this guy tells him, okay, this is what you got to do, and you'll be healed. And he rejects the word. I wonder how many times we come to church and, and we say, God, I know you've got the answer for me. And we hear the word spoken and God moves and we reject it. Why do we do that? I wonder if it's out of pride or if it's just our humanity, but I don't want to ever find myself where I finally get to my healing and then I reject it. I finally get to my answer and then I reject it because it doesn't make sense to me. Well, God, I wouldn't have done it that way. Well, no, you wouldn't. That's why you're not God. That's why God's God and you're not. Because his ways are beyond our understanding. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And thank God that none of us is running the universe. So Naaman rejects it and he's on his way back home. And it's, I find it so interesting. He's there because of the word of a servant, the word of a slave. He rejects the word of God. He rejects his healing. He's going to go back home unchanged. You could walk out of this place unchanged today if you wanted to. He walks back home. He sets off on his course home to be a leper. And one of his servants speaks up and says, you know, if he had asked you to do something real great, you would have done it. But he gave you something real simple. It was by the mouth of another servant. It makes me think back to Sister Vernon's dream about how there's so many different people that impact one life and so many different opportunities that different people have to speak up. Another servant speaks up and says, you know what? If he would have asked you to do something great, you would have done it. All he asked you to do was go dip in a dirty river, and you wouldn't do it. And it was at that turning point when another servant spoke up, another unexpected person. Not this was, <laughs> oh my, I feel the Holy Ghost. It was the word of the prophet that gave him the key to his healing, but it was the word of the slave that changed his heart. Don't underestimate yourself because you don't stand behind a pulpit. Don't underestimate yourself because you're not a licensed minister or you're not this or you don't have a degree in theology. Sure, the word of the Lord goes forth from this pulpit, but you don't know when you will be the turning point that a servant needs to speak up, that an unexpected person needs to speak up and change somebody's life forever. I want to be used by the Lord. And I want to be used by the Lord in the way he wants to use me. I want to speak up when the time is right. I hope you feel that way too. This world needs us. This community needs us. This community needs the gospel that gets preached in this church. And that's going to get spread through you. I hope you receive that today. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for speaking to your people, God. I pray that you would let this word take root in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that it would find that, that target that you sent it out for. You said your word would never return to you void, and I believe that. I pray you help us to stand up in this last hour. I pray you help us to be that light that needs to shine in the darkness. I pray that you help us to spread this gospel. I pray that you help us to not be intimidated, to not be ashamed. You are not ashamed to call yourself our God. Let us not be ashamed to call you our God and to proclaim you in this world. I pray that you'd let your will be done in this next service, God. I pray that you touch your people. I pray you let your, your works take place. I pray you accomplish what you want to accomplish. Speak to your people. Anoint your messenger, God. Let us receive your word with gladness today in Jesus' name. And we give you the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. You are dismissed until 1030.